Okay, good morning everyone. I apologize for the delay. I had a terrible trip. I missed my tram and then the train was so full that I had to be like this to the wall. So yeah, um, <coughs> I would like to spend a couple minutes on the last two slides from the last lecture. I have really bad sore throat, so my voice may also be kind of weak. But if you remember, we ended up last lecture with the conclusion, yes, with the conclusion for our systems dynamics model for this company, fast growing uh, electronics. Yes. And now the last two slides are actually completely different. Um, the last two slides are about linking the BCG matrix. If you remember the BCG matrix, cash cow, stars, dogs, and question marks to the product life cycle. Okay, we haven't introduced formally the product life cycle, but it's actually very simple. Just like with any life cycle, um, every product has phases. And in general, we can recognize four phases. The, uh, I think they're mentioned here. No, they're mentioned here. Okay, let's look at this graph. We have introduction of the product, product growth, maturity. So this is where the the market gets uh, the gets mature and then saturation. Now, personally, I wouldn't call this saturation. I would call it decline or something like that because saturation implies that uh, things reach kind of an asymptote, right, in in a technical sense. But for some reason, people decided to stick with saturation. Uh, however they mean decline. The maturity and saturation for me are synonymous, but uh, that's how they use it. So what's shown here is uh, for whatever product, we have the profit and we have the sales. And of course they more or less have the same shape, given some uh, assumptions on, on, the, on the costs to produce this product. So the development costs, they're more or less uh, similar across all phases, so this distance here is more or less the same. Uh, but the shape is important. Please remember the shape, it's a bell-shaped curve, right? So we have an uh, increase in whatever product and then a saturation or, yeah, maturity and then saturation. So we'd like to link this product life cycle. It's a life cycle. I mean, the life cycle idea is very simple. We'll see more li examples of life cycles today. But we'd like to link this to the BCG matrix. And the BCG matrix was, uh, you know, these four different categories for products. And it's basically this one, right? So if we have a hot selling product, let's, let's think about what a hot selling product is. How does it start? It starts with an immature market, new market, and the product is, is selling very fast. So there's a high growth in, in still undeveloped market. So it's kind of a question mark. We start as a question mark. We have this, this product which may sell a lot in this, in this new market. So we start the product life cycle is here, right? So the green curve is the product life cycle. So that point would be exactly this introduc introductory phase, this one. The orange curve is the learning curve. Learning curve meaning uh, what do you know about this product? about the technology, uh, about the, the demand, about the market. What do you know about this product in general? I obviously don't know very, I mean, you still need to know a lot. There is a lot for you to learn, all right? Now, if it's a hot selling product, it will move in this direction. It will become a star. And remember, a star is a very fast growing product in a new market, all right? So it's a star. We're right here, it grows very fast in the green curve. We're in the growth phase. You know a little bit, what you need to know is a little bit less than before. And even if you look in this, there's additional information here, which is the income that you get and the expenses, the investments you make in this product. Obviously, in the beginning, you need to make a lot of investments for this question mark to become a star. Once it's become a star, uh, you kind of start getting a lot of money for it with relatively fewer expenses. It's a hot selling product, so the next phase, this is the growth phase. It will mature eventually. What will become of it is a cash cow, right? So we're in the ma well, yeah, maturity phase, 
It's a cash cow, meaning that we get even more money out of it, and we don't have to invest as much compared to the previous cases. And we, we know, obviously, a lot more. And then eventually, even if it's a hot selling product, it will become obsolete and goes back to dogs. If it's a hot selling product. If it's not a hot selling product, so we start as a question mark, we don't know what it is, it turns out not to be a hot selling product, well, it's a dog immediately. So the jump is here. Uh, that's the most unfortunate case. All right, so this was the last few slides from last lecture. Let's start with the new one. This is six. So something is really slow with my computer today. Um, <coughs> the new lecture is going to be primarily only about modeling of the sales evolution. So what happened here? Doesn't open. Ah, okay. All right. Oh, I need a new one. But before that, let me rem remind me uh, remind you what we did last time. Last time we saw the, let's say, the first um, more interesting model. It was about the inventory and the workforce dynamic. Um, and what we tried to model there was how the s relatively small fluctuation in sales. Uh, transfers to relatively large fluctuations in production or in upstream. And we identified two main causes for this, which together only generate this effect. Separately, they don't. This was the time delays, basically, in adjusting your workforce and adjusting your inventory. And we saw during the self-study that um <coughs> if you reduce the workforce adjustment to the minimum. So basically you adjust as fast as possible your workforce or your production, but you leave yourself some time to adjust the inventory or the coverage, the inventory coverage, then you reduce the oscillations, right? So th this was an important distinction. If you, you still have to adjust your production as fast as possible, but the target production that you adjust to uh, takes some time to determine. So give yourself some time to determine that. Don't just take the, the demand today and try to match it. Wait a little bit. All right. Uh, then we looked at the case study. It was a very successful result. They saved a lot of money. The numbers are given in the last lecture. And today we start with a related topic. It's about... Um, modeling the evolution of sales or demand. Sales and demand are kind of synonymous. Sales is more the business term and demand is more of an economics term, but they're more or less the same. So we'd first we'd like to see how sales look like, the distribution of sales, how they look like, and then we'd like to model it. That's the, the topic for today's lecture. Probably you've all heard about uh, the S-curve, have you all heard of, who's heard of the S-curve? Okay, well, less than a half. So that's good. I mean, we have a lot of stuff about the S-curve, so I don't want to be redundant. Um, okay, so let me remind you from the last two slides, the, the product life cycle. So we have four phases, and we can map these four phases to the BCG matrix. An important thing, the sales at any given point of time, or the demand, it's a bell-shaped curve, right? So if you take si the instantaneous sales, they're bell-shaped. But if you take the aggregate sales, so the total sa sales over time, they, they look like S, like an S-curve. It's an empirical fact. There's nothing we can do about it. Uh, we'd like to model it. All right, so this is, this is what we're going to do, modeling the time evolution of sales. Um, 
before we start, let me introduce a few basic notions. So sales, I mentioned already, uh, are equivalent to demand. So when we talk about sales and demand, they're the same thing. One is the economics term, the other one is the business term. But demand is not enough. We need supply, obviously. Or supply is equal to production. They're both the same thing. And we need those two things in order to have any sales in the first place. And the demand and supply, as you all know, are matched by the market. The efficient market hypothesis. So at any given point of time, the demand is matched by, uh, by the supply. An important factor for this matching to occur is marketing. Right? So the demand side needs to be aware of what's available on the supply side. And this is where marketing comes into play. You know, marketing is not just fancy... What happened? I think my uh, my battery is kind of down. Although I didn't say anything. Hmm. I don't know what happened. Anyway. So this is the role of marketing. And marketing is not just um, fancy advertisements or stuff like this. Think about it as information information about what's available on the supply side. All right. Um, the life cycle that I just introduced and that I was supposed to introduce last lecture, it can be applied to basically everything. So we can have a life cycle in product development. We can have a life cycle in sales development, life cycle in supply development. Right? You can always imagine this kind of increase for example, let's take demand. Demand increases for a hot product, it reaches some kind of a mature state, and then it starts to decline. This is the life cycle for demand, for instance. So you can apply it also for production. You ramp up your production, this is the growth phase. The production reaches stable levels, and then you ramp down when your product becomes obsolete. So the demand, the, the life cycle model can be applied both to supply and to demand. It's just, uh, oh, I didn't show you this, but that's it. <sighs> okay. Aha, uh -huh, I know what I'm doing. I'm pressing buttons here. So let's see. Um, let's look at this graph. This is the kind of a... It's not empirical yet. It's an idealized version of how things look like. But look at the red curve. Disregard what the legend says. The red curve could be the demand. In fact, it is the demand. So demand for whatever product increases, reaches a mature state, and then decreases. It's a very nice bell-shaped curve. The green curve is the total sales, the aggregate sales. So for instance, at time 100, this point would show you all the sales, all the units that were sold up to time 100. So the cumulative number of sales. And they look like this. So this is the... Ag um, the aggregate demand, or, or the, the cumulative demand, it looks like this. And the blue curve don't care about it. But we'd like to model this, this situation. And um, I'm starting to introduce the model now. These guys, it's the, s the famous bus innovation model. Probably you've seen it somewhere else as well. Have you? Who's seen it? The bus innovation model? Oh, nice then you would, you would be very interested in what I have to say. All right, so um, the bus innovation model, or our, let's say, before we start with the bus innovation model, our hypothesis would be, obviously, demand or sales. They depend on customers, so somebody needs to buy it. Um, and those that don't know yet about the product, we call them adopters here. The adopters are people who've already bought your product. And we have the people who still haven't bought it. That's all that we have in our simple model. Adopters and potential adopters, which is obviously simplification. But let's not concern ourselves with that. Um, 
and you can immediately see the, the feedback here. When we increase the number of adopters, the number of potential adopters decreases. So this is it. This is how we model the demand life cycle. Demand life cycle, sales life cycle. We assume um, it's a very popular approach to, to resort to uh, disease spreading. So people think that the adoption of a product resembles a lot how disease is spread in a population. Somebody becomes infected, then the infected person uh, in interacts with a non-infected person, then the non-infected person becomes infected. The real uh, disease spreading models, or they're called also the susceptible infected models, SI, and then there should be actually an R for recovery. So susceptible infected recovery models, assume that you have susceptible people, potential adopters in our case, infected people, actual adopters, and we have those who've already recovered, they will not get sick anymore, they will not uh, infect anyone else, but the bus innovation model disregards those. So for the bus innovation model, we only have adopters or infected people and non-adopters, non-infected people. And obviously the adopters infect, in a sense, the, the potential adopters. We don't have people who, who have bought the product and, and then they, want, they don't want to buy it anymore, meaning they've, they've recovered. We don't have this. So this is how it goes. We have a potential adopter, and a potential adopter becomes an adopter somehow. This somehow is given by the, that rate here, the um, transition rate K, and it resembles a chemical reaction. So with a certain probability, a potential adopter becomes an adopter. We can model this a little bit more. We can say, well, the transition rate depends on the following things. It depends on the contact rate C. Contact rate means how many infected people does, uh, well, let's talk about adopters. How many adopters does a potential adopter meet at any given point of time, per time step? So it may be, for example, 10. If you're very well connected, it may be zero if you're not connected at all. Uh, but it's how many people, infected people, you meet at any given time step. I is the probability that meeting an infected person would make you infected. In other words, meeting an adopter, you may m meet 10 adopters, uh, but if you're, let's say, you have a very uh, simple way of life, uh, you may not adopt their new gadgets, even though you may meet hundreds of them. So this is the probability that you will adopt uh, whatever these guys are offering you. And that simply, N is the total population, and A is the number of adopters. So this is the fraction of adopters. So you can see the contact rate, uh, the transition probability is how many adopters you have in your population as a fraction, how many of those you meet, this is the contact rate, times the probability uh, that you actually adopt uh, this product or you become influenced in a way. So this is the, um, resembles the social herding effect, right? So you're influenced by others. You do what they do. This is, this is also called social herding. Okay, so we have the number of adopters plus the number of potential adopters gives you the number of the total population N. That's all we have in our population. All right, and let's look at the dynamics. Um, how do the potential adopters change per time step? Well, it's very simple. Well, in other words, how many, um, how many adopters come out of the potential adopters population? Well, it's very simple. It's basically this equation here. So you have the number of potential adopters. These potential adopters, maybe, I don't know, 10, they meet this fraction of the population which is infected. They meet, out of this population, they only meet 
given number of people, C, and multiply by the probability for infection, they, they actually adopt. So this is the differential equation, and obviously it's always negative, which means that the population of potential adopters always decreases. So you can already imagine what the outcome of the model is. The number of potential adopters will go to zero. There would be total adoption of this product. Uh, whether that's realistic is a different thing, is a different case. And obviously, the how the adopters change is simply the opposite of the potential adopters. Whatever comes out of the potential adopters goes to the adopters. Is this clear so far? I mean, that's a very simple equation, um, and I, I will repeat it if, if, if you need me to. Even if it's not intuitively clear, you will have to do it in the self-study. So it will, become, uh, it will become clear. It's one of the simplest models, the bus innovation model. It has lots of flaws, lots of disadvantages. We'll talk about them. Um, but to get, a, to get a feeling of, of, of these things, you, you just simply need to do it. And please man, uh, note the increasing difficulty in the self-studies. So first you had to implement, you had to work with the model which is in Vensim. This was the rabbit fox population. It's right there, just open it. Then you had to build a model given the model structure in the, in, in, in the slides. This was the workforce inventory model. You had the all, all the components. But now you have to build a model just from these two differential equations. It's a very simple model. You have just two stock variables. Uh, but you still have to do it. <coughs> and there are interesting things you can do um, to study it. Okay, so this was one way to model the demand life cycle. Let, rem let me remind you, by demand life cycle, we mean the sales evolution in time. Okay? They're both the same thing. Now we'd like to know how can we extend this demand, right? As you, as a, as, a, as a company, you would not like to reach this maturity phase and then go down, but you'd like to extend the demand, to generate more demand, if you'd like. <coughs> and the next few slides are about this. How do we extend the demand life cycle or the sales evolution? And um <coughs> think of it in this way. Imagine that for a given uh, product or a given technology, you have um, a certain potential, demand potential, okay? So imagine in the ideal case, the whole world is your, are your potential customers, okay? And you want to tap into more and more customers uh, with time. So that's one way to look at it. The, the other way to look at it, I already said, you generate new demand. But you can also look at it in this way. We don't generate new demand, the demand is given, but we just cannot tap into all of it. Um, and, and we'd like to, to tap more into it. How you can do this? Well, uh, in two ways. You can change, you can introduce a new technology, but still address the same need for your customers. Okay, so the examples in the, in the next few slides are about audio technology. So let's stick with audio technology. The demand, or let's say the need of your customers for audio technology to listen to music, all kinds of stuff, is given. And let's assume that potentially the whole world wants to do this. But of course, depending on your technology, you may not be able to tap into everyone. Look at this. For instance, um, this is a, the, the vinyl records. They're a nice way to listen to music. But you cannot tap into the whole population. You need special care. You need to take special care of those things. You need special equipment to play them. There are special ways how you need to store them. So it's kind of a hassle. Not everybody is willing to do this. So what you do to tap into these guys that are not willing to use that thing, well, you simply introduce a new technology. Now we have MP3. 
It's a new technology, but it addresses the same need. Listen to music. So you tap to more and more people by, by introducing different technologies or new technologies. And here you can see all different examples for new technologies. We have the, the, tape, the tape cassettes here, um, CDs, MP3 players. Well, where are the MP3 players? There is somewhere here. And then we have DVDs, right? So this is the basic idea. You introduce new technologies to tap into more and more demand, but still address the same need. And things become simpler, actually, by, by introducing new technologies. If we stick to this, then we can talk about technology life cycle, right? You can apply the life cycle concepts to virtually anything. Technology life cycle would be the same thing. You introduce a new technology, it's being adopted very rapidly. Then there is kind of a saturation, maturity in, in its adoption. And then nobody wants to adopt it anymore because it new, technologies, new technology has come on the market or um, it's just too outdated. But normally new te technologies come. The second way to do it is uh, to introduce new products, but still keep the same technology. The idea is the same. You need to address the same need for your customers, but you make it simpler for them to adopt. So you introduce new products, simpler products, but using the same technology, right? And the example here is with the tape recorder and the Walkman. Uh, so tape recorder. Uh, yes, so that's the tape recorder here, and the Walkman, I'm not sure if it's on the slides. Well, anyway, the tape recorder and the Walkman is the same technology, right? Tape. Yes, okay, I agree that the Walkman needs some microelectronics as well, but the technology which addresses the your customer's needs is the same, it's tape. But it's a different product, it's make it, it makes it easier for people to listen to music. They can carry this Walkman in their pockets instead of this big machine, the tape recorder. All right. <coughs> and by doing all this, we simply extend, one way to look at it, extending the demand, creating new demand, or tapping into unrealized demand potential. And this figure illustrates what I just said. Here, we have imagined that this is the total demand available, the whole population, okay? You start with some technology, and at this point of time, this technology is not adopted anymore because these people here, they don't want to adopt it. It's too much of a hassle for them. It's too big. Um, it, ta it needs too much care, stuff like that. So what you do, well, you introduce a new technology to address to tap into these additional people. The same thing you can do with products. Now the green curve is one technology life cycle, so one of these green curves. But within this technology life cycle, you have many products, right? You introduce many products still with the same idea to uh, address more and more demand. All right. <coughs> so these were kind of a preliminary remarks into technology adoption and product adoption. So this is technology adoption, product adoption. Now what we'd like to do is to look in more details uh, um, into technology adoption, how new technologies get adopted. Or in other words, it's basically the same as, as uh, how people buy this new technology. Or in essence, it's the again the sales evolution, our main theme for today. Um, <coughs> so how do technologies get adopted? First of all, you may know from experience, I'm pretty sure you know from experience, that technologies can be adopted in two different dimensions. That's it's not working. Well, that's time and space, right? So different people can adopt the same technology in different times. For instance, early adopters adopt the latest gadgets when they're released. Late adopters, they wait for the price to go down and still adopt the same technology. Or in space, you know that uh, different countries get the latest gadgets at different times, depending on the product. Normally, uh, Europe gets 
It's one of the last in the developed country, uh, developed w uh, part of the world to get the the Apple products. I think. Is that true? I think so. Who? Maybe, but at least okay. The U.S. is the first one. Let's agree on that. Um <coughs> so yeah, that's different ad adoption in space. And as soon as we talk about space, we need to change the terminology a little bit and talk about diffusion. Oh, I forgot to put my timer on. Can somebody tell me how much time is left until the break? Ten minutes, Ten minutes. all right. Now oh, we're right on time. All right, so we need to change the terminology a little bit and talk about diffusion, how technologies diffuse in space. That's a physics concept. In fact, technology diffusion is a field by itself. People do research just on technology diffusion and try to understand what factors influence the speed of this diffusion, the scope of this diffusion, and things like this. We will not concern ourselves so much with space. We will only concern ourselves with time. What makes people adopt a given technology at a given time? Or what makes people buy a given techno buy a given product at a given time? Yes. When you said uh, technology diffusion or space and, and you gave example of countries and the product comes at a different time, I mean isn't it still more time? I mean mm -hmm. from space it's it's really time if you think of the environment as as one way of time. Yes, yes, that's Yes, but I mean these are not uh, these two things are not uh, contradictory to each other. So you can, of course, it takes some time for a diffusion process to start from here and reach that point. It takes some time, of course. That's true. But even if you have the same, so the idea with the time dimension here is that even if you're in the same space with somebody like you and me, for example, we're in Switzerland, you may buy the iPad before I do, even though it's available at the same time for both of us. And uh, with the diffusion, yes, there is obviously time. And this is our goal now, to model the technology adoption, and please don't be confused by the different terms, technology adoption, technology life cycle, sales evolution are the same things. I mean, we sell this technology, right? We sell this product. So it's the same thing, but it's more interesting with technology. Okay, so we'd like to, m to model the um, technology adoption or the sales of this technology, and we know what we need to get. I will show you empirical evidence, obviously, uh, but for now, we need to get an S-shaped curve. And please remember, the instantaneous rate of sales is bell-shaped, right? So at any given point of time, if you calculate the distribution of sales, you get bell-shaped curve. If you integrate this distribution, you get the cumulative number of sales, and that's the S-shaped curve. This is what we want to model. Of course, uh, if, we able if we're able to model this, we automatically model the bell-shaped curve as well. Now, this is, this is mentioned here. The number of, of sales at any given point of time, or per time interval, is a nor normal distribution. And that's also an empirical fact. It has to do with the life cycle, right? Growth, maturity, decline. So a, few, a little bit of empirical evidence. This is space now. And um, the example here is from a hybrid corn introduced in the US. Uh, so apparently there is the reference to a paper. I will upload this paper in the literature section, but apparently this hybrid corn had some beneficial ability beneficial things for, for the for the corn. So you can get more corn using these seeds. That's the basic background. And what it, what is shown here is how different states adopted this hybrid corn. Uh, technology, which was, um, yeah, I think it was introduced in the, in, the, in the whole United States. So you can see the state of Iowa 
this is the adoption of the hybrid corn, right? Here we have percentage of farmers which have adopted this hybrid corn technology, right? So we can see a nice S-shaped curve. So by 1943, everybody has adopted the hybrid corn in Iowa. But in 1943, about 40% of the farmers in Kentucky have adopted the hybrid corn. And obviously, if you look in Texas and Alabama, uh, it's even worse. So in 1943, nobody even knew about this technology in Texas. Well, not 1943, but yeah, well, 1940. So this is how technologies, the same technology can diffuse in space, different states. This is uh, now diffusion in time. What is shown here is, um, again, hybrid corn. And this is number of farmers. Uh, no, it's not hybrid corn, sorry. It's some kind of wheat, 2,4-D wheat. Some special wheat, um, wheat as in agricultural wheat. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know what they do in Iowa. Um, all right, so you, you can see that it took 12 years. Well, not 12, but 10 years for everybody to adopt this kind of new wheat. So this technology took 10 years to, 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 to get diffused, to get, uh, to get adopted. And the question is why? We'd like to understand why it takes so much time for some technologies so much uh, and less time for other technologies. Another example is um, adoption of different technologies in the car industry. And you have different um, different car technologies like automatic transmission, power steering, air conditioning, and so on and so forth. And you can see that different technologies get adopted in different times. It takes more time for some. Look, the automatic transmission. It started like this, and it took a lot of time. And even it took a dip here. I don't know what happened actually here. Uh, until it gets it gets adopted to 100 percent, and I'm, I think it's uh, it should be specific to a country, because I don't think in Europe everybody has automatic transmission. Uh, but anyway, there is yes, there is a paper given there. Anyway, so you see that the automatic transmission took a lot of time, but check this out. This is the electronic ignition. It got adopted to 100% really, really fast. In, I think it's uh, in about four or five years, it got adopted. And the automatic transmission took 20, 30, 35 years to get adopted. Different technologies also in between. So this one was also quite fast. This one was slow. Right? So this is how different technologies get adopted um, with time. In fact, what we can see is that the speed of adoption for newer technologies decreases. It's kind of an interesting thing to observe. Even nowadays, newer technologies are introduced all the time, and they get less time to get adopted. Right? And this is, uh, this is an example of different technologies, how much time it took to get adopted, virtually to 100%, uh, I believe. So it took just one year to adopt in containers. But it took 14 years to adopt centralized traffic control. All right. So let's go back to the bus innovation model. It can still be used for technology adoption, right? We'd like to explain the S-curve for technology adoption. So let's go back to the bus innovation model. Remember, we have adopters and potential adopters. And we, we work with the fraction of adopters. This is the number of adopters divided by the total population, right? So this is F, the fraction of adopters. Um, and this, so this approach to explaining the S-curve the bus innovation model and the next few models that we're going to see basically have to deal with information diffusion, 
So how does information about this new technology get uh, spread out in the population? Marketing, I already mentioned this one way. But the second way, which you know, obviously, is the word of mouth effect, right? So this is uh, personal persuasion. In the um, context of infections, the word of mouth effect would basically be you talking to somebody and getting infected. Um, but, you know, distinguish between advertising or marketing, which is more of a... Um, common source of information that everybody gets and word of mouth which is based on personal interaction. So the bus innovation model is all about word of mouth effects. If you look at the equation it's basically word of mouth. Why? Well let's, let's look at it. Um, <coughs> so remember we had this K, the transition rate K in the previous slide. Now we call it beta. Change of notation suddenly but we call it beta and it's equal to the contact rate again the number of people you meet at any given point of time per time period times the probability that you're influenced by these people in the case of diseases you have no choice you are influenced so the infection rate is beta and the bus innovation model remember is this we can transform it if we talk about relative frequencies we can transform it to that equation now, it's a very simple transformation. You simply plug in f of t equal to this. You plug it in here. n of p is equal to 1 minus n a, right? So, n, uh, sorry, not 1. n minus n a. And divided by n, it gives you 1 minus f t, right? It's a simple transformation. It's a simple transformation. So, you everybody understood it. Who got it? Not enough, not enough. All right. How much time do we have? Okay, that's enough. Let's, because, yeah, that's that's basic thing and um, we will need this in the in the coming slides, right? So you have this, C times I, And I would just write NP as N minus NA. Okay? Okay, I will we'll continue after the break. It only takes five seconds. All right, let's start again. Um, is there anyone from group M here except Sylvia? No one from group M. Good to know. All right. So this is this is basically how you substitute. Let's see if I can use no, I can. This is how you substitute uh, that thing. You substitute this one here to get this one. Remember, the rate of change of the adopters is simply the opposite of that. So it's simply the same expression without the minus. Okay? So what I've done here, I've represented the potential adopters as n minus n a, right? The total population minus the adopters. It gives you the potential adopters. We divide both sides by n. Here we get the rate of change of the fraction. Uh, this is c times i. This is f f of t, this divided by n is 1 minus f again, right? So this is how you got it. Clear? Who got it now? Did you get it? Oh, okay. Good. Um, when you solve it, right, so we have this equation. Let me remind you what this equation was in the first place. It's the word of mouth, right? These are the potential adopters, the non-infected people. They meet some fraction. They meet the infected people. 
And with a given probability, beta, they get convinced to adopt the new technology. Convinced by word of mouth, personal interactions. When you solve that thing, this is the expression we get. It's the so-called logistics curve. Now you're probably asking yourselves, as you should, what is this? Right? It was not here, but now it's here. It's simply a funny mathematical trick to make this more standard, in a sense. I'll show you what I mean. The actual solution is, in fact, this. Okay, this is the constant of integration. It's given by the initial condition, minus beta times t, right? But in the if you transform it in this form, so if you just make the substitution, mu is equal, is it? Uh, yes. Is it this? Yes, that's it. So if you just make this substitution, you get that. From here, you just get that directly. And why is that interesting, or let's say more useful than this? Well, you can say that at time t equal to mu, and mu is a constant, so at some time t, that thing would be zero, the whole thing would be zero, and the whole function would be one half. And if you remember how an S-curve looks like, like this, this equation would give you an S-curve which has one half here. So the maximum rate of change of this function is here at one half. Okay, so the function starts growing, 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 and then the growth is maximum at one half, and then the growth starts to slow down. So this is why an expression like that is kind of useful. You can immediately see what is that kind of transition uh, time, where the growth is maximum, and then after that it starts to decrease and to saturate. Um, right, so this is the solution. It's the so-called logistics curve. It reproduces the S-curve, right? So this, this was the bus innovation model which assumes word-of-mouth effects. Solution is given by that, and we have an S-curve. But, as I mentioned, the bus innovation model is very limited. So there are some limitations. Not some, but they are quite substantial. For instance, you can see here that if in the beginning Cheers, oh, bless you. Uh, if in the beginning we have no adopters, nobody has adopted, which is the case in real life, then the whole thing is zero. This will never change, right? This is zero in the beginning. The rate of change is zero. We have a constant, um, constant zero. So in a sense, the model is unstable at zero. Unstable in quotes because it it's not technically unstable, but it's not realistic. So the word of mouth effect can only work if there are some people to spread the word already, right? If there are no people to spread the word, it won't get spread. Simple as that. So this is one thing we need. Uh, we need initialization somehow. This is the so-called cold start problem, right? We need to start the process somehow. Um <coughs> Another thing, the adoption of a technology depends only on this personal persuasion between an adopter and potential adopter. But of course you can ask yourself the question, why should I adopt just because somebody else told me to? Right? So that's, that's one thing. Um, <coughs> and it, in, it's not realistic in, in a different sense as well. In most situations, what we observe is a critical mass phenomenon or a threshold phenomenon, which means that 
the adoption is almost negligible, but once enough people have adopted, enough critical mass has accumulated, the adoption is very fast. But here we have constant rate of adoption, this S-curve. It's constant. Even in the beginning, depending on the parameters, you can model, you can recreate all kinds of slopes, uh, which is not really realistic. We don't have this critical mass phenomenon. Um, it assumes homogeneous population. So everybody is the same. The only difference between people in this population is that some have adopted this product and some have not. But eventually everybody will become an adopter, which is again not really realistic. The analogy to this disease spreading is incomplete in the sense that the real uh, susceptible infected recovery models, they assume that people get infected, then they recover and they're not infected anymore, they're not contagious, they will never get infected anymore. But in our bus innovation model, we stop at the point of getting infected, adopting it, adopting the product, and you stay an adopter for the rest of your life, which is again not really, not really realistic. Uh, most importantly, however, is this one. There are no economic ingredients. And this is something that you will encounter in other models in this course, but also in... Uh, in, in, in models in different courses where you have some mathematical equations which seem to reproduce the shape you want, but there's no economic ingredient, there's no policy that you can come out with, economic policy. So there is no competition between products. We in fact, we have only one product, one technology. There are no network effects, no lock-in effects. These are important concepts. When you generate a lock-in effect, then nothing else can get, uh, can get adopted. But, surprisingly enough, the bus innovation model fits um, empirical observations very well. There is plethora of literature on how the bus innovation model can fit different, uh, different technology adoption scenarios. And I'll show you one of them, which was done, in fact, by Professor Schweitzer, uh, in, in the chair of systems design. They use the bus innovation model, as simple as that, to fit or to reproduce the spread of donations after a natural disaster. Right? You can think of the spread of donations, again, as a spread of technology or a spread of product or sales. Right? It's the conceptually, they're the same. You do, some, you do something based on the influence of the others. You buy a product, you donate money, you adopt the technology. It's all the same conceptually. Um, <coughs> so and they, just, they just use this simple model. And they have a paper, which is nice. So they looked at, um, at uh, the data which showed the, adopt uh, the donation behavior um, so it was, I think it was a German database which showed some donation behavior for uh, East Asia. And the time span was July 2004 of this database. It was quite quite big uh, database. July 2004, June 2005. So it's more or less one year. And the blue one is, uh, is it mentioned somewhere? No, it's not. The blue one the blue curve is the daily number of donations, the number of donations. The red one is the amount, right? So they're more or less matched, which means that it's not the case that one individual donates huge amounts of money. It's the fact that many individuals donate more or less the same amount of money. So they, they're matched pretty closely. But, so the total amount of donations um, is, is it mentioned? No. This is the money. This is the total amount of money, and this is the total amount of donations. So what happened here? This was December 2004. Between December 2004 and January 2005. In particular, it was 26th of December 2004. 
Do you know what happened there? Exactly, it was a tsunami in East Asia, in uh, Indonesia. Right, so there was this, uh, well, it was an earthquake and then a tsunami. Um, and look at this spike. So it's not the fact that here we have no donations. No, in fact, we do. See, this is the time span from July 2004 to December 2004. So this line. There, is, there are still donations, but compared to this peak, they're virtually, um, virtually uh, zero. Okay. <coughs> so what they found is an S-curve. It's slightly strange looking S-curve. Not really strange, but uh, it's prolonged at the, l at the high end, right? So uh, the blue, uh, sorry, the red dots are the empirical data, the empirical distribution of donations or the cumulative number of donations, if you'd like. And this is time, right? So this is June 2000, uh, May 2005, uh, everything has been donated so far. Okay, so it's an S-curve, and the blue one is the bus innovation model, the one that I showed you, with these parameters. This one, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, it's in your notes. So what we do here, uh, please look at your notes now. You have a slightly different representation of the bus innovation model, and the difference is the beta. So we had a beta there, but now the beta is 1 over tau. Now don't get confused. The reason is the following. So beta shows you the probability of getting infected. It's, the mul uh, it's multiplying C times I, the contact rate, the number of persons you meet, times the probability you get infected. So beta is, let's say, the number of infections, if you'd like. When you divide 1 over beta, you get, let's say, the time between two success successive in uh infections. So the tau, 1 over tau that you have, the tau would basically be your time between infections. So the longer the time, the bigger the tau, the smaller the beta, and the more time you have to wait before there is an infection occurring. So what, you, what will happen is your S-curve will get kind of stretched, right? The increase would be slow. If the tau is very small, meaning beta is very high, you just have to wait a little bit bef between infections, so you immediately get the S-curve like this. So the, tau, the tau is simply used uh, to introduce the a time dimension, to think about time. So they fit this model, uh, this data, they fit it with the parameters mu, mu was over there, and this is the time, tau. They don't mean anything, this is the one of the critics for the bus innovation model. Economically, they don't mean anything, these parameters. But they still fit the data. Um, now, do they? Do we have a good fit? What do you think? Do you, would you like this fit? Yes? No, that's fine. I mean, if you stop yourself here, if you stop yourself here and you plot it again, so you would have a different aspect ratio between the x and the y axis, uh, you would get kind of an S curve, good looking S curve. Is this a good fit? It's intuitive. I mean, there is no right or wrong answer. Would you accept this as a good fit? If you're a manager and I come to you and I ask you, well, this is a model that reproduces our sales. And based on this model, I propose that now we introduce a new product, for instance. Would that be a good fit? Intuitively, what do you think? It's, it's not? Yes. Who said yes? How many say yes? And the others say no, I assume. All right. Well, um, Yes and no. Aren't you a little bit suspicious what's going on here? Just a little bit. I mean, it looks like an important important region. I mean, here we don't care so much. 
this looks kind of important. So it turns out that it is important. And what these guys tried to do uh, was to understand why the bus innovation model predicts something like that, the blue curve, but the red one is actually deviating from it. And what they found out was the beta plays a role. What, what, or beta or one over tau. What, what do I mean? Now, beta, remember, is the number of infected people per time period. It's the multiplying the contact rate times the probability of getting infected. Or let's talk about adopti uh, in adoption uh, terms, the number of people you meet who've already adopted times the probability that they will influence you and you will adopt. But as time goes, the, the bus innovation model assumes that this beta is constant. But in reality, as time goes, uh, beta doesn't have to be constant. Maybe as time goes, you're less uh, susceptible to word of mouth influence. Right? So in the beginning, when a new gadget comes out, Everybody is excited about it. The new adopters, the early adopters are very excited about it. They're very aggressive in promoting this gadget to their friends. But as time goes, maybe the early adopters or the adopters become less convincing. They become less enthusiastic in, um, in spreading the word, in a sense. And potential adopters, they're not so easily influenced anymore. So beta changes. It could be. Right? That's one hypothesis. And they tested this hypothesis. And it turns out it's true. So what these guys try to do, they try to f fit beta. This is one, o one over tau. Uh, in, uh, so, yeah, ironically, not ironically, but unfortunately, this C is not the same as this C. Okay? They had different Cs. This is the contact rate. Contact rate, the number of adopters you meet per time interval C is just a constant here. So they try to fit 1 over tau. They extracted from, so they extracted from the data. This is the extracted 1 over tau, the, the red one, as time goes by. So you see, even without fitting anything, you see that 1 over tau goes down, which means that the time for adoption increases. What could that mean? Well, that could mean exactly this lack of interest. People lose interest in this new thing, in this new technology, or adopters become less enthusiastic in promoting this new, uh, new technology regardless. The time increases. And they've managed to fit it with, with this kind of a quadratic um, equation. And yes, the coefficients are not given, but of course they were estimated from the data. So that's how you can, uh, yes, and it's also said here, in the early stage of this uh, disaster, people were really willing to donate money. They were easily influenced by pictures in the media uh, and by communicating with, with other people. But as time goes by, they're less, uh, they become more indifferent. Okay. <coughs> so this is a, this, w Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, can we identify this time when we observe this kind of shift? Um, the answer is, I, I basically it cannot be answered because the, the question is not precise in the sense that we d this is not a threshold process. It's not like, it's not like uh, we have a lot of interest and then zero interest. This is how the interest develops. Right? So what is this point is up to you, how we, how we define it, right? Maybe for you, at this point of time, we can say now there is a clear indifference in the population, and now we take this time. But maybe for somebody else, it's, uh, it's here, right? So it's kind of difficult to, to pinpoint qualitatively even uh, where we want to be on this kind of curve.
Is that good enough? Oh, so if you if you take the um, the maximum of the derivative, yes, that could be one candidate. That could be one candidate. <coughs> yes. Okay, so this was an example how the bus innovation model can be used to fit real data. It's not just corn, hybrid corn, but also as the uh, as kind of diverse as donations. Now, let's look at um, improvements to the bus innovation model, namely how to solve the cold start problem. One idea, so remember, the bus innovation model was word of mouth effects only. But one idea could be broadcast of information. For instance, in the beginning when a new technology is introduced, a new product is introduced, before anyone has adopted it, we have marketing or we have advertisements, we have some kind of source of information which announces this new technology. And this is known as the common source model. Common source because the whole population has a common source of information. This could be a keynote speech, it could be an advertisement. So what, what is the suggestion, well the idea here is that this common source of information convinces at any given point of time, a given fraction of the population to adopt. Think of it as advertisement. Advertisement convinces a given fraction of the population at any given point of time to adopt. And this fraction is given by this, uh, of the non, uh, of potential adopters, of course, not the whole population. This is the fraction. And if you just have this model, without the word of mouth effects, but just the advertising effects, well, this is the dynamics, right? It's simply alpha times NP, but NP was basically one minus FT. So this is the relative frequencies again. And this is the rate of change of the adopters. The resulting function is an exponential. It looks like this. This is obviously not an S-curve. It solves the cold start problem but it's not an S-curve, it's just an exponential. And I don't know why this is black, but these different curves correspond to different alphas, right? So when we increase alpha, obviously the curve increases faster. Okay. <coughs> well, we already have the ingredients to improve the bus innovation model. The bus innovation model was only word of mouth. Here we saw only advertisement. Well, let's combine them. Word of mouth and advertising. You know, this is, this is how modeling works in general. You take little blocks and you combine them together and you see what happens. And this is the, called the mixed source model. Mixed source because we have mixed sources of information. Word of mouth and advertising. And it, it really, it's simply adding the two m equations together. Bass innovation model plus common source. Uh, yeah, plus advertising. And we get the S-curve, plus the benefit of no cold start problem anymore. Um, <coughs> yes, yeah, so this is the S-curve, the adopters. Um, what is shown here is, um, right, so in the beginning, there, is no, there are no adopters. Nobody has adopted the product, but <coughs> this, there are a certain amount of people which we call kind of innovators basically who are influenced by this advertisement right different interpretations can be given for, for this common source for the advertisement you can think about one way is advertising uh, relates to people who want to be at the forefront of technology, right? People who want to have the latest technologies, the latest gadgets. So we call them innovators in a sense. So these people would be influenced by the advertising and they would jumpstart the whole process here. And then these guys would generate word of mouth effects. In addition to that, 
uh, the advertising still works. So in essence, when we combine these two things, we get the new adopters are like this. And this is simply the imitators. These are only the people who are influenced by word of mouth. They imitate what other people do. All right? And they obviously develop like this. And the difference between these two curves are these people who are influenced by advertising. Okay. <coughs> we have an S-curve now. If you solve this model, we have an S-curve. Don't concern yourself too much with this equation. We, we do some variable substitutions to make it look nicer. Uh, but in fact, this is the S-curve. And choosing the right parameters, you can reproduce different uh, shapes of the S-curve. For instance, look at the green one. We can reproduce this kind of little dip and then increase like that. And again, this shouldn't be black. Anyway, so this is the mixed source model if you want to do it in Vensim. It's not part of the cell study, but if you do it, it will be very nice. It's a very good exercise. We have the two components, word of mouth. This is BAS. And I forgot to say that the BAS innovation model was actually created by a person called BAS, Frank BAS. It's not uh, random. So the word of mouth effect, effect, this is the BAS innovation model, and the advertising. This is common source. We combine them together, and you can understand everything. Basically, it's simply the equations. The word of mouth effect depends on the probability of getting infected, I. Contact rate, C. So C times I gives you beta or 1 over tau. And the total population, N. This is the word of mouth effect. OK, obviously, the potential adopters as well. Uh, and we have this reinforcing feedback here. What does it mean? Well, if we increase the number of adopters, this number of adopters would promote the product more, so the word of mouth effect would increase by simple numbers. The word of mouth effect increases, the adoption rate increases, the number of adopters increase as well. And we have the balancing feedback, of course. The adoption rate cannot increase indefinitely. The potential adopters, they are influenced by advertising, they adopt the product, so the more potential adopters we have, the more, the bigger percentage of them would be influenced by advertising. The bigger percentage of them influenced by advertising, the bigger the adoption rate. Um, why is where is the where is the where is the balancing feedback now? Oh, it's the market saturation. Okay. All right, so yeah, so the bigger the potential adopters, the more the bigger percentage of them would be influenced by advertising, the bigger the adoption rate, but then the bigger the adoption rate, the less the potential adopters, you know, because we have a limited number of potential adopters. Right, so these guys would get exhausted really fast, really quickly, these numbers here, and then this thing would go down as well. Yes, yeah, so th for the advertising, this is alpha the advertising effectiveness, if you'd like. We introduced this as a percentage of people who get influenced by, ad by advertising, which in other words is the advertising effectiveness here, and then that's the, that's the mixed source model. How can we improve it? We can, of course, improve this model a little bit. Well, one way to improve it is, um, now remember, what all this reproduces are symmetrical S-curves. But in real life, as you saw with the automobile technology adoption, they're not symmetric, right? So one way to reproduce this non-symmetric S-curves is to assume heterogeneous populations. <coughs> heterogeneous populations meaning every individual has a different alpha and a different beta. So a different susceptibility to advertising and a different susceptibility to word of mouth effects. But this would not be a systems dynamics model, right? Remember, we only talk about representative agents, representative people. This would be an agent-based model, topic of next semester. Next semester's course in collective dynamics of firms. So this would not be an agent uh, system dynamics model, but we can still do it. 
and we will get the S curve, right? So we can define some people are rich, so they will adopt more easily, for instance, so their alphas would be bigger. The poor people would have lower alphas and lower betas, so you can imagine what will happen, right? The we let the rich people buy the products first, so there would be a huge adoption really quick, and then when when they've already bought the product, the relatively unrich people come into play and the S-curve would be stretched out. So it would be an in unsymmetric S-curve. So you can imagine all this kind of stuff. A second way to do it is to introduce <coughs> kind of a birth rate. So people are born in the population. This is the same model with the birth rate. So we have a birth rate, it increases the number of potential adopters. Um, and so basically, potential adopters plus adopters give you the whole population, and the potential adopters are some fraction of the whole population. This is not really needed for the model. It's just a kind of an illustrative uh, kind of um, hint how the potential adopters and the adopters are linked. So there's some gives you n always. So if you introduce a new birth rate, what 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 does it mean? You introduce new people, so they can be adopters immediately. They can be potential adopters, but um <coughs> this now opens the door to competition, right? Because if you have new people coming <coughs> and you have more than one product, <coughs> which product would these people adopt? It's not clear. There would be a self-study on this. So this just gives you a prelim prelim preliminary information. What happens when you, what could happen if you introduce new people? If you just keep the same model as before, just introduce new people, constantly refill these guys, you would not get something different. You would just still get an S-curve, which kind of always grows because it never gets saturated. You always get more and more people. So in essence, this is not really an improvement, but it simply opens the door to thinking, okay, what can I do with these new people? Where can I allocate them to? And you can only think about these things when you have more than one product, more than one technology. We'll see this in the coming lectures. Now, unfortunately, this uh, diagram is kind of wrong, and I will explain why. The idea here is, however, um, to model, so again, improvement of the mixed source model. We'd like to model fads or trends, especially in fashion. What is meant by that is, so far, potential adopters become adopters and they stay adopters for the rest of their lives. They never become, they never give up the product, they never give up the technology or adopt a different technology. They, st they stay adopters for the rest of their lives and we'd like to change that. <coughs> so, disregard this. Just scratch it in your in your uh, handouts. I will update the slides, by the way. Disregard the immigration. Okay, that's not important. It's just remove it. Disregard this thing. It's also not important. What we're left with is essentially the same model: potential adopters, adopters. But now, adopters. Okay, and add a flow which goes from adopters goes back to potential adopters like this. Just add a line there. As a reminder, I will update the slides as I said. I just saw this this morning. So just add a line here, going here, and then this is a rate by which adopters become non-adopters, uh, become potential adopters. So what can happen now is, yes, potential adopters are influenced by, um, okay, in this model it's just word of mouth effect. They become adopters, here. Now, what can happen to these adopters? Well, they can get disappointed with the technology, disappointed with the product, and just give it up forever. They will never buy this technology from that company again. So they become, they discard the product, and they become uh, so-called discarders. Or in the disease spreading model, they become um <coughs> recovered. They've recovered from the disease. They will never get sick again. So we can forget about them. 
And of course, they have some discard rate by which they discard it. Now, what if you, if you look at your line that you d drew like that, potential adopters also may just give up the technology and wait for the next one. Or they might give up the technology, so don't buy the product next time, um, become potential adopters and adopt a different product if you have more than one product in your model. Right? So this is what can happen. Right? And this is a way to model fats, actually, fashion, short-lived hypes. We're not going to do this, it just gives you an idea of the things you can do. Of course, uh, this is actually taken from, from Vensin, from the models there. So if you'd like, you can explore these models and uh, play with them a little bit. But it's not required, it just gives you an idea what, what we can do. Okay, and the last part of the lecture would be about um, a different approach to the S-curve, to the evolution of sales. If you remember, I told you that all these models so far would be concerned mainly with information spreading, how information is spread. Word of mouth, advertising. This was the, the idea here, as a reminder. right? This is the word of mouth effect, the Bass Innovation Model. This is how it looks like. You can immediately see that there is, every time you see minus squared, there is a saturation going on. right? So just multiplying the brackets out, there is saturation. And um <coughs> this is what we did so far. But there is a different way that we can approach this, this whole issue. And it comes from population ecology. It has to do with birth rates and death rates. I'll explain exactly what this means. Let us start with the exponential growth. We start from this. You know, this could be the rabbits um, that we saw in two lectures ago. There's some kind of growth depending, of course, on this parameter gamma. Right, so depending on the parameter gamma, if it's positive or negative, this can explode or it can die down, doesn't matter. But now we assume, and yeah, so this is gamma. But now we assume that the birth rates and the death rates depend on frequency. Right, in the rabbit, popula in the rabbit example, the birth rates and the death rates were just constants. But now we assume that they depend on frequency. For instance, this is the frequency dependent birth rate. Uh, m frequency or density. The density of, of people uh, who've already adopted the technology or who are already infected. So we can assume that if there, if there is no one, no one in the population, is it really five minutes left? Oh my god. All right. Frequency dependent birth rates. So, if we have no population, then we have a given birth rate B, which is called the density independent birth rate, logically enough. But as more people are born, as more population grows, the less likely they become to reproduce because you know there's crowding effects and stuff like this. The same with the death rates, only inverse, right? The more people there are, the higher the death rate, infections, overcrowding, stuff like that. So if you plug in this density dependent birth and death rates into that, we get this whole thing, and that's an S curve. Right? So by just starting from an exponential growth rate and adding the idea that the birth and death rates are frequency dependent, we get an, an S-curve. It looks like this. We can change some variables. We can define the carrying capacity, which is equal to this. Basically, transform the function to the familiar mathematical form, something divided by something. Well, this is kind of ugly. So this is much better now. All right. R, R is this. So it's the density independent net rate. And this is uh, constant, doesn't matter. All right, so what, what is birth and, birth and death in terms of technology adoption, right? It, it's uh, intuitive what, what it means in population terms, but in 
what does it mean in terms of technology and adoption? I mean, people don't die when they adopt the technology. No, actually, that's not true either. So, I mean, yeah, they, they sometimes die. But um <coughs> when we talk about birth and death, what we mean from organizational theory is two things. It's the so-called or two stages of technology adoption, legitimation phase and competition phase. Legitimation phase is basically getting this technology to be adopted in the first place. You don't care about... Um, about the price you're charging. In fact, you may be charging less to e excite people and, and get more people to adopt it. So in a sense, your birth rate, kind of birth rate of your technology increases because you try to get more people to adopt it. This is the, or try to make the technology legitimate in a sense. You don't care about your money now. Competition phase is after some companies, let's say, have adopted your technology, they've supposedly got competitive advantage. But as more and more companies adopt your technology, the competitive advantage of the early adopters would die down. Right? It won't everybody will have the same technology, so your the competitive advantage of you as an adopter would disappear. So there is now a competition uh, between the people, between the firms who've adopted a given technology, which means that there is less incentives for new companies to adopt that technology. And this leads to um, yeah, lower returns for late adopters. And that leads to the saturation here. Let me see if I can show you one interesting slide. Yes. So what, um, what this, so this was the birth and death. Uh, this is now, I mean, it's basically the same thing about hybrid corn again, what the guy tried to do was to take was to take this, right? So this is kind of a density independent net rate, and this is some constant, and try to fit the data. And there is some kind of a uh, regrouping of that term, right? A is, uh, so B is the rate of adoption, the speed of adoption and A is simply positions the curve on the time scale. It's not so important. This is not so important. This is the important thing, the rate of adoption of your technology. And the guy tried to look at this and tried to fit the corn adoption pattern into this. So what he did is the following. Taking the log of that leads to this. Right? It's also a simple transformation. This is the natural logarithm. So if you as the researcher take your corn data, hybrid corn data, you calculate that from the data and you try to do a simple regression. This is a simple regression. All right? And he found this. This is the rate of acceptance or the growth beta. And you see that some states, if you remember different states adopted differently, some states have a very slow adoption some states have very, like Indiana, uh, I don't know, I think so, yes, have very high rate of adoptions. And this is the R squared value. It's how much, how many percent of the variation in your data is explained by the model. This is very good. I mean, very high values. This is the carrying capacity, don't care about it. What cares is this. So he fitted the data with using the normal linear regression and found this. So now the question is, and with this I will end, why, remember the original question, why does this state adopt a technology faster than this one, for instance? Okay? And what we do here is multiple regression. You simply assume, well, there are different factors which influence the adoption. These different factors are called X, right? So in his regression, the Xs were the size of the farm, the productivity of the farm before adoption, the productivity of the farm after adoption, and I think, uh, th yeah, uh, the profitability. And yeah, not just the size, but also the profitability of the farm. So, you know, this is basically ba a, basic, a basic multiple regression. You've seen it before, especially in econometrics. Right, so what he did, what he found, this is the results, but uh, this is the conclusion, is that only large 
and efficient firms adopted the hybrid corn. Only large and efficient firms. Isn't this counterintuitive? You would normally expect that inefficient firms would adopt a new technology hoping to become efficient. But in fact, it's the opposite. Efficient firms who've already done pretty much everything to become efficient, they see this new technology as the only way to improve their efficiency. Whereas inefficient firms have a lot of things to do besides adopting a new technology. So this was the results he found. This is the result from multiple regression. And look, <coughs> this was his multiple regression. This is a factor and this is a factor. X3 is the average size of the firm. It turns out that this coefficient is significantly different from zero and it's positive. Therefore, the bigger the firm, what this means is the bigger the firm, the bigger the X3, the bigger the beta, the bigger the adoption rate. X8, what is X8? This is the yield of the firm before adopting or the efficiency of the firm before adopting. Well, let's look at it. What is it? It's positive and statistically significant. This is the standard error. Therefore, the bigger the X8, the bigger the yield, the efficiency, the bigger the adoption rate. This is how you interpret the results from multiple regression. And this is how he reached his conclusion. And you can, uh, well, so this is by different states. This is different reporting districts. The conclusions are the same. Only that here we have a different factor X7, which is this kind of difference. But it's again, the bigger that, the bigger the beta. So let me recap what we did. We started from, the from that. This is the simple bus innovation model. All right. And we tried to see what are the factors that influence the, be the beta or the B, the, the rate of acceptance. And in this particular case, it was an empirical study, first of all. So it wasn't like a conceptual thing uh, like we did last time. But it was an, an empirical study. You do a multiple regression. First, you do a regression. You try to find out the most important thing. You try to find out whether your data actually follows this. If you couldn't fit this, you're wrong. This is not an S-curve. Your data is not an S-curve. But he fitted that and then tried to find out what beta is. And this was the multiple regression model. Okay, that's, uh, that's not so important. These are just concluding remarks, which you can read yourself. They're really conceptually easy. Um, one important thing I'd like to mention is that the S-curve, or the bus innovation model, um, or all the models actually that we saw today, they leave out firm strategic behavior. There's no strategic behavior on the, on the firm's side when they adopt the technology. They simply either influenced by advertising or by other firms. But there is no strategic behavior like I will adopt if my competitors adopt or something like this. And we will work with these models in the, in the coming lectures. Um, an important thing also, um, competition. We saw competition between technologies. <coughs> Uh, not between technologies, but competition between firms for the same technology. Does it promote diffusion or not? If you remember this argument, I said that it doesn't. But actually the evidence is inconclusive. Because if you think about it, um, if the firms, like it said here, um, if the competition between firms decreases their profits, then of course they will not adopt a new technology, they will have less money to do this. But if they anticipate the results from competition, well, they can adopt the new technology I mean, like at the start, when they have more money. So the evidence is kind of inconclusive. Um, yes, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>